I'm a native Charlottean, so I don't know <coughs> if the loyalties go between Duke and Carolina. Um, I will say it was a good omen today because I pulled into a parking lot and there were a couple of guys at 8.30 on a Saturday morning kicking a soccer ball around at the same field that I grew up going to soccer camps at right over here at Queens. So it's a pretty good sign. Um, I think I want to grab the clicker from you too if I can. That would help. <laughs> so just to sort of give you a little bit of backstory about the film, there were four of us that, that put our lives on hold um, to make Pelada, which was a documentary following two American soccer players as they traveled around the world and search for the other side of the game. So for the gritty street games. So here we are in Buenos Aires. This was the fourth country that we visited on our first of what would be several trips, probably about month three of what would be two years of on and off traveling. That's Luke and Gwendolyn, the two American soccer players. And then just to sort of give you a full view of the crew, that's myself and Ryan who were behind the camera. In a different location on a different day, obviously. But um, so on this day, you can imagine us behind them, Ryan wielding the camera, and me sort of the unlucky one carrying all the bags. We're in Buenos Aires, we're walking down this dirt path further and further away from the chic upscale neighborhoods of, of the city and deeper and deeper into a different type of neighborhood set back amidst these sort of highway overpasses and construction and trash, we were headed to a place called Villa 31. And Villa 31, or Villa 31, was a place that came with all sorts of warnings. It was Argentina's, or the Villas were Argentina's version of the Brazilian favela. It was a shanty town located in the center of the city, home to about 40, or at least 40,000 people, mostly illegal immigrants who would build their houses out of these discarded materials often stacking them, you know, two, three, four high. It was just, in general, a place that you didn't go to. And before we could even get into the neighborhood, we got approached by at least three different police officers, one who came up to us and said, es tu vida, no es mia, it's, it's your life, not mine. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how you can get that, you know, when you have a little bit of broken Spanish and accents to deal with. But you're probably asking yourself why, and preparing the speech and looking back at this now, you know, four years later, I kind of been wondering the same thing. How did we end up here? So we had spent days running around Buenos Aires looking for games and looking for people. I mean, again, we didn't just want shots of people playing soccer. Soccer was the vehicle to lead to these stories. So we were looking for interesting stories and interesting characters that would, that would tell us something that we would otherwise never know. So after running around Buenos Aires for days, only finding these empty parks and these sort of sterile pay-to-play clubs, we kept hearing about this place, and it kept coming back that there was this Vija that would have the gritty, spontaneous street games that we were looking for. And so at that point, the warning sort of faded into the background, and it became more and more like this exact story that we had to chase down. So on this day, we walk in without a local, without an NGO, without a translator. It felt like it was what we were supposed to be doing. It felt, it felt right for us. We didn't really allow ourselves to think of the alternatives, I think is what I'm really trying to say. Um, we emerged after walking on this ominous walk out onto this huge concrete court. Not knowing that this is what we were going to find, we find basically a neighborhood league game on a Sunday afternoon. 11 aside soccer, guys in sort of homemade uniforms tumbling on broken concrete and gravel underneath these highway overpasses that were just sort of quaking with the traffic of Buenos Aires and trucks and buses. Around the field was what seemed like the entire neighborhood. You could barely run out of bounds before running into all these different spectators. So in a lot of ways, we kind of breathed this collective sigh of relief. Although it was only halfway there, we were still stuck out like sore thumbs. People were probably wondering, who are these people, these tourists that have wandered into the wrong neighborhood? And so we had to kind of get up our confidence from there. OK, how, how do we go about this? How are we going to talk to somebody? How are we going to connect with these people? Moments later, we were communicating in broken Spanish to one of the players along the sidelines. Finding a time where we could, he understood what we were after, and, and we were able to figure out with him a time that we could come back and interview him about the more informal games, the more street games that happened in the neighborhood. And we did come back. We filmed for two full days in the Vija. Get you a shot, there you go. Uh, we came to know a certain slice of the neighborhood. Uh, we didn't go too far. We were kind of warned on where we should and shouldn't go. 
but we came to know this place, its sights, its smells, the homeless dogs, the, the way that people would sort of leave in the morning and go to work in the city and come back in the afternoon, and that's when the games would start up and people would sort of gather around and watch. And we met people like uh, Gustavo, this guy who grew up in an immigrant family, who'd grown up in the Vija, whose favorite player was also a guy who'd played in the slums and had risen to play on the national team, as well as these younger players. Uh, get, there we go. These guys who would tell us about how tight their community was, and, but also how misrepresented and how ostracized they felt in the, in the outside of their Vija in the city of Buenos Aires. So there was a story coming together for us. It was an interesting glimpse of two sides of a city through the lens of soccer. But the real effect of the Vija on us, or on me as a filmmaker, definitely happened behind the camera. On the one hand, we felt sort of protected and we were taken in by these guys who we were interviewing, who were, who were looking out for us, but we were consistently reminded that we didn't really belong, that we were foreigners on somebody else's turf. We knew that they were looking out for our equipment. We knew that they were washing our backs. They were constantly telling us where we could and couldn't go. And as I was preparing for the speech, I just kind of looked back at my journals during the trips, because I would usually keep like a handwritten journal as we traveled. And here's just one of my entries uh, after the first day that we were filming there. It took about 24 hours to get a sense of the place, but by no means were we less gringo. Our Spanish still struggled, and people still yelled out to us as we walked by that we were going to be robbed. <laughs> it's funny now. <laughs> uh, I'm, noticing, I'm noticing my hesitancy to get out the camera because of the looks that I keep seeing that say, what the hell are you doing here, and, and who the hell do you think you are? And so I was 22 years old. It was the first time I'd picked up a camera and traveled uh, outside of the country to basically embed myself in these communities. And it was sort of at that moment where this romantic notion of what it meant to be a documentary filmmaker was being tested for me. This idea of, I knew I had this drive to document these stories around me, but coming to terms with the reality of being a foreigner in somebody else's, in somebody else's turf. It was new, and it was very real in this place. And in the short time that we spent in the Vija, because two days for us on the road often felt like a lifetime, uh, I came to terms with this, and I learned that you know, what it means to be in a community documenting somebody else is, is partly about the respect that you have for those places and understanding that those, there are divides that separate you and knowing what they are and trying to understand and be as true to them as you can. But it's also about having a level of obstinance <laughs> and a level of stubbornness in some ways and, and not allowing yourself to be defined by them and not allowing yourself to shy away from crossing them. So in other words, I stopped feeling the need to apologize for having a camera with me. And the camera became more of an extension of my eyes and my hands because we believed in this story that we were trying to tell. I had a mentor tell me once, uh, another filmmaker, who said that 5% of what you shoot on any given video shoot should be absolute crap. Because if you aren't taking those risks, then you aren't trying. And in that context, he was you know, referring to creative risks and you know, using your camera in a different way and all that sort of stuff, but I think that that same advice pertains to this idea of stepping outside of our boundaries as people. And as a documentary filmmaker, I think about that because it's, you have to step across those divides. You have to engage people. You have to try and gather their story as well as have them understand where you're coming from. And so those boundaries are meant to be broken or meant to be bent. There was no way that we could be less gringo in that moment, in those couple of days that we spent in the neighborhood. But we were still able to make a connection in that place. You know, and on the last day, we sat around with these guys, cameras off in their living room, passing around liters of Coca-Cola and Fanta, and just sort of shooting the shit and sharing our own stories. And it, and it felt like we had made a connection. So Argentina was early on in our travels, but it was probably, it was one of the first giant unknowns that we walked into. But there were more. <laughs> there was Hosinia, the one of the largest favelas in Rio that we negotiated our way into to film. There was Iran, where we traveled and were urged not to film anymore by our government-sponsored tourism agency, but which we slightly disregarded. <laughs> uh, there was San Pedro Prison in Bolivia, where we basically bribed our way in so that Luke and Gwendolyn could play with the prisoners and we could interview them. And the rewards continued to happen as well. 
there were the construction workers in Cape Town, South Africa, who were building the, one of the World Cup stadiums, who spent their only break of the day playing soccer. There were a group of freestylers in Shanghai who would play on the only space that was available for, available for them in these urban spots outside subway stops and next to these old temples in downtown Shanghai. And there was this guy, Austin, who you'll see in a second. Um, there he is. Oh, we lost him. Uh, well, Austin was a guy who had lost his entire family in violence in Nairobi, but still spent his every day teaching kids how to play soccer in Mathari Valley slum. So I could go on and list more of these experiences that we had. This was sort of the journey of Pelada. Every day we would uproot and we would move, move to a new location with, with all the same barriers, race, language, class. But when we made an effort with the languages that we did know, a little bit of Spanglish, some facial expressions, some gestures, maybe some mispronounced Chinese, we found people it's easy in Chinese, especially. Uh, we found people willing to engage and for a moment willing to share their stories with us. And we could get a glimpse of a life that we would otherwise never know. And as filmmakers, we had the opportunity to share that with others. And so as I sort of talk about this idea of waltzing into dangerous neighborhoods and pulling out cameras in tricky situations, what I'm really wanting to say is, is for people to look at the value of the things that tie us together as much as those that separate us. Because I don't think that it's about being a filmmaker or a traveler necessarily or a soccer player, but it's about what we do in our daily lives to sort of reach across those gulfs that separate us as people. And I think we all have the opportunity to sort of take a chance, step out, have a conversation, uh, engage with a different part of our community, and see our world in a different perspective. You know, for us, it wasn't, it may not seem like it, but it wasn't just this act of walking past that policeman and, and, and being stubborn enough to walk into what might have been a dangerous situation for us physically or for our equipment. It was also about once we got there, how did we start that conversation? You know, how did we connect with these people who were so different than us and who did not expect us to land in their neighborhood on that Sunday afternoon? It's about allowing others to see us sort of struggle through this, uh, this idea of being a foreigner in somebody else's territory. And I think it's about allowing yourself to be vulnerable. And so I would challenge everyone that's here, it's, it's not just about networking with somebody, maybe starting a conversation at, at, a, at a TEDx, but I would challenge you to go outside of your own worlds and outside of your own bubbles and reach across to different parts of your community because it's those moments that make this world a smaller place and making the world a smaller place isn't just great for documentary films uh, or music or all of that, but it, it, you know, it connects us. It allows us to see people in a way that we would never see them, and it, it makes the world a better place. Thank you.